Hi, I'm Chris Mutchler, Fractional CTO and Principal Enterprise Architect from Virtual Elephant Consulting. And in my 25 plus years of operational experience, the one thing that I've learned as an individual pr- practitioner, which is critical to our skill set, is running a home lab. And so in this video, I'm going to share with you the updates that I've made to my home lab for 2025. Let's get started. Over the last 25 years of my career, one of the things that I've learned that's critical for me to be able to keep my skills sharp and to be able to have the opportunity to new, to learn new things is to run some form of home lab. Now, the various forms that this lab might take for you or that it's certainly taken for me across these 25 years has been different based on the needs that I had at the time. In the late 1990s, it started out with just a few desktop computers that I would have built and run Linux on to a Spark workstation or a DEC Alpha from way back in the day that I first ran Red Hat on to Intel Nooks in the early 2010s when I was first trying to miniaturize my home lab and to be able to save space on both physical location space and power within my house to things like running a Pico cluster when I was first learning how about Kubernetes and wanting to get my hands on the keyboard as I prepared to take the CKA certification test to what it is today, which is almost a mini data center running in my home with a rack of servers running uh, VMware software as well as being able to have an external Synology array as well as running vSAN with full-on data center switches. And so I'm going to share with you the things that I'm currently running today why I chose to upgrade the home lab as 2024 came to a close as I prepare for some of the things that I have in store for Virtual Elephant Consulting and the Virtual Elephant YouTube channel in 2025. Any home lab should really take into consideration the requirements that you have. What are you trying to learn? What products or technologies are you working with day to day that you need to get better at? What do you want to run? Is it going to be running just home lab stuff where it's just R&D type things for you as you prepare for a certification or learn a new technology? Or is it going to be running services for your home itself? And I've done all of these things in various forms over the last uh, several years. I've gotten away from running actual services for my home network that my family relies on. My wife got tired of things breaking and seemingly always when I was on a business trip. And so now my home lab is isolated to just being a lab for me. It doesn't run any of the services that my kids rely on uh, day to day to be able to access the internet or access their classes or anything like that. And so actually that I enjoy because that gives me a little bit greater flexibility so that if I do break things, it's okay. I can sometimes leave them in a broken state when I'm traveling and I don't have to worry about, oh, is this, I have to get this fixed because it's impactful to the rest of my family. So regardless of whatever your cost budget might be or whatever your needs are, try and structure your lab based on those things. Now, in during the pandemic is really when I took what I was running previously, which was a series of Intel nooks and kind of graduated into what I have today, which is almost like a mini data center with a half rack of servers. And one of the things that I did during the pandemic was I went out and found some Dell R630 rack mount servers off of a used computer uh, recycler and went and purchased those servers. And then I've taken those servers now and I've expanded it. So what started out originally, if you've seen some of my other videos about my home lab, was three Dell R630s. I had a a moderate-sized Synology with about 7 terabytes of space in it. And I had two uh, Cisco Catalyst uh, 2960 one gigabit switches. And at the time during the pandemic, that was more than enough for my needs. But really, as I looked to my full-time job with Broadcom still and what they're doing around VMware Cloud Foundation and what I needed to be able to do to run some things that I wanted to be able to accomplish in 2025 in my home lab, and certainly a lot of this comes around to licenses, right? Software licensing, Uh, I get licensing. I'm fortunate enough that I get licensing through Broadcom as an employee. If you do need licensing, I'll just say look into the V-Expert program. That's the best way to do it. 
um, at a low at a low cost if you need VMware or Broadcom by VMware licenses. Anyway, going on. So I needed to be able to upgrade my home lab to something that could run VMware Cloud Foundation. And certainly that meant for me, while I was already running NSX, um, I was not running vSAN. And so I needed to be able to run vSAN, um, which then uh, necessarily meant that I needed at least 10 gig switches. So I knew that I was going to need to upgrade the switching gear that I had within the house, as well as uh, be able to have a few extra servers for fault tolerance and redundancy with vSAN with the different storage policies that you can run. Now, you can still do all of these things on the cheap. I will just say up front that I spent about $3,000 at the end of 2024 upgrading my environment. Um, I was also fortunate enough that I had a good friend and coworker who had a pair of Cisco Nexus 3064 switches that were fully licensed that he was generous enough to give me. All I needed to be able to do was go out and buy the SFPs that I needed for the switches. Um, So that certainly reduced some of that cost that I needed to be able to do. But certainly, you know, rely on friends where possible. But, you know, you can get a lot of these things uh, for relatively low dollars um, on sites like eBay. And I did end up buying almost everything off of eBay this time because the previous uh, computer recycler that I'd used originally during COVID had actually gone out of business. And so I couldn't go back to them to get more servers. But I did end up buying two more identical uh, Dell R630 uh, 1U rack mount servers. And um, over the course of time, somewhere about a year and a half ago, I did actually upgrade the processors in these in those original servers um, so that they would be compatible with vSphere 8. Again, keeping these things, you know, uh, as relatively inexpensive as possible has always been a goal of mine. So I did upgrade um, those servers originally. So now I have five Dell R630 uh, rack mount servers that have um, dual socket, um, Intel uh, Xeon E2680 processors, V4 processors in them at 2.4 gigahertz. For my needs, that's those CPUs are more than enough. And from a compatibility perspective, um, it meant that I could run um, VCF 5.2.1, which is what I've installed. And we'll talk a little bit more um, in in uh, later on in this video and in subsequent videos. Um, but I do. So I have five servers. They all have these dual socket uh, E2680 processors in them, V4 processors, which is important. Um, and then each server has... Um, 256 gigs of memory in it. Um, So it brings my total to about 1.2 terabytes um, total in the cluster um, of of free memory, um, which is more than enough. Certainly, I've certainly found that I'm far more memory bound than I have been CPU bound um, within the environments. Um, And then I went and bought a series of SSDs. Now I am using vSAN OSA. Again, Regular SSDs, far less expensive on the used market than trying to buy NVMe to be able to support vSAN ESA. Certainly for my home lab, I don't need a lot of storage performance. Nothing that I'm doing is intensely storage performant for the things that I'm running or the projects that I'm working on. So I did go for relatively inexpensive disks um, for vSAN just so that I could, from a uh, minimal perspective, be able to get vSAN running and deployed. So when it came to vSAN, again, I'm doing vSAN OSA to keep things relatively inexpensive. And so for each server, what I ended up buying used on eBay was I bought a used Intel uh, 150 gigabyte uh, SSD for the caching tier. And then for each server, I bought two um, 750 gigabyte um, Intel SSDs for the capacity tier. I'm running one disk group on each node. So again, keeping things relatively inexpensive. Um, It gave me roughly about seven terabytes of vSAN storage when things were all said and done across the five nodes. So again, more than enough. So coupling the the vSAN upgrades, the high-end or not the high-end, but like the compatible processors, dual processors, and then certainly 256 gigs of memory per node was more than enough for my needs within this home lab environment. Now, the other thing that I had to do with the five servers was to be was to actually go out and buy 
um, 10 gigabyte network cards. So I bought a compatible card with the Dell R630 servers. Um, it's a dual port 10 gigabit um, NIC that I put in the back of each server. And so that really was the was enough for me at that point to be able to have five servers with the two Cisco Nexus 3064 switches that my friend gave me um, to be able to get started and actually deploy uh, VCF 5.2.1 within my environment. Now, the final thing that I really had to spend money on was all of the SFP connections. And I'll say that this was probably the most expensive part um, of all of the new hardware purchases that I made with the exception of buying two new nodes, which really weren't all that expensive. I think I got each node for about $600 used. So for about $1,200 of the 3000 that I spent was on the servers. But I think about the next $1,000 was just on the SFPs. So I had to buy, um, essentially, uh, I bought the kind of SFPs that have the cable between them. So I bought 10. I actually messed up and bought 20 because I didn't realize that they were two packs on eBay. But that was good because my friend who gave me the switches actually needed some new cables. And so we were able to trade. And I felt like I was giving him a little something back as I was still getting far more with the two switches. But regardless... Um, I did that, and then I did end up buying a UPS off of Amazon for all of this new gear, and then I built everything into a nice rack, which I first the first rack that I bought off of Amazon ended up being too small, and then fortunately, again, the friend who gave me the switches had a spare rack that he wasn't using, so he gave that to me, and you'll see here in the B-roll that I'm showing uh, what the actual physical setup of everything looks like in that back storage closet. Now, there were a couple things that I had to do that hopefully you won't have to do as I was going through and upgrading all of my new home lab gear. I realized that my house was at a grossly underpowered, having been built in the early 1990s. So I did pay for a number of electrical upgrades to the house that I really don't consider part of my home lab. But certainly when they were doing those electrical upgrades, one of the things that I had the electrician do was run an, a secondary dedicated circuit just for my home lab. And so that meant that now with the additional servers, the actual data center uh, Nexus switches and their higher power requirements and everything that I was able to run everything, break it up over two different circuits. So from a power perspective, when I say that I feel like I'm running a mini data center now, it's really for a lot of these reasons. I've got dedicated circuits. I've got UPSs in the back now. I've got... <laughs> I just, it just sounds crazy because the switches are so much louder than those old catalysts. Like you could probably leave the catalysts underneath your actual desk, run them and really not hear them except for when they first power on. But those Cisco Nexus switches are just so loud all the time. Luckily, everything that I have is in a basement underground. And so relatively nobody else in the rest of the house can hear it. But these upgrades have now allowed me to be able to install VMware Cloud Foundation or VCF 5.2.1 within the environment and this is now the basis for my home lab going forward and as I work to build out everything uh, I'll be sharing it with you uh, all of my viewers and subscribers to my YouTube channel over the next several weeks and you can see all of the different things that I'm doing within this new home lab now one of the things that I'll just say in conclusion so certainly you can do what I've done which is kind of build a mini data center I've seen guys out there on Twitter who have way more than I have and it makes makes look what I have uh, you know childish almost in comparison you can certainly use things like the Intel nooks those are a great platform for home labs relatively inexpensive super quiet um, you can run a variety of different types of uh, applications and programs whether it's you know bare metal stuff kubernetes you know you want to run vSphere on it you certainly can William Lamb has a number of blog posts out there on how to use the nooks and those other small form factors to be able to do that. Or, and one of the things that I've done from time to time, and I still do today based off of some of the videos that y'all have seen in the last year, which is I'll still go out and consume public cloud services, right? So having an AWS account or an Azure account or a GCE account so it can certainly be what your home lab is. It doesn't necessarily have to be something in your home itself when I say home lab. So Use those resources that are out there. Use the free credits that Amazon, the free tier that Amazon gives you, that Azure gives you a number of free hours when you first sign up. I think it was like 300 or something when I first did it to be able to go out there 
and use the different services that are out there so that you in 2025 can learn new technologies, can accomplish your goals and further your career. And that's really what the Virtual Elephant channel is going to be all about in 2025, which is sharing more of the things that I've learned over the last several years, specifically around Kubernetes, running Kubernetes in a variety of formats and uh, offerings and platforms so that you as an individual can upskill yourself to be able to go out there and get that job that you want or get that promotion that you're striving for, be able to maybe change careers and go from one you know, storage administrator, SRE type thing to maybe more on the developer side. So we're going to be talking about all of those things in 2025. I'm super excited about it. I'm going to be launching a new series uh, that you'll see the first few videos dropping sometime in January around a new project that I'm calling Kubernetes Four Ways. And so I'm going to be taking this home lab that we've just spent the last few minutes talking about, and I'm going to be running Kubernetes four different ways. I'm going to show you how to run it inside of VCF with the VMware uh, Tanzu platform. I'm going to show you how to run Red Hat OpenShift um, whether you consider it on a VM or bare metal, it's all going to be the same. I'm going to show you how to run Red Hat OpenShift and, the, and what that platform brings to you. I'm going to show you how to further leverage Rancher within a home lab and run Rancher with a variety of different clusters and different versions um, within your environment and managing the life cycle. And then certainly continue to show you how to leverage uh, Kubernetes on top of you know, bare metal or virtual machines and basically running an open source style platform, the challenges that might pose to you as an application developer or as an infrastructure uh, SRE versus maybe one of these other platforms like running it through Rancher, running it through Tanzu or running it through Red Hat OpenShift. And so that's going to be the Kubernetes four ways. And I've really been working on this uh, sample application that I published early last year um, on my GitHub page that you can go out and find. Uh, I've been revamping it to make it far more robust so that as we take things and talk about what cloud maturity looks like from an SRE or a DevOps perspective, I can show you practically what that'll mean for you as an application developer or as an infrastructure architect or an infrastructure SRE. So I'm very excited for what's coming in 2025. I hope that you'll subscribe to the channel, turn on notifications so that you can find and see when these new videos are launching over the coming weeks, please make sure that you leave a comment below. Let me know, is there something specific about my home lab you'd like to learn a little bit more about that I'll be happy to share with you? If you're looking for you know, uh, maybe what components that you bought, I'll post in the description of this video all of the things that I purchased on eBay uh, to be able to upgrade my lab so you can see the full specs. I look forward to talking to you more and engaging with each of you more via LinkedIn, Twitter, or certainly YouTube in 2025. So please don't be strangers. Thank you for your time, and I'll talk to you soon.